Okay, so here we're going to talk about post-renal failure. This is the easiest, in my opinion, to understand because the underlying mechanism is pretty much all the same with each of these. Um, so we're looking at obstruction here. When I say post-renal failure, you say obstruction. There's obstruction at some level of the urinary tract, and this leads to renal failure. Um, so uh, there's one particular cause here that's very, very, very common. You probably already know what that is. Um, so you really want to hone in on that one. Uh, but we're going to go over a number of causes of post-renal failure. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right-hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you very much who have already donated. And definitely subscribe and you will get notifications every time I put a new video up. Okay, so post-renal failure is due to urinary tract outflow obstruction. So we have our kidneys here. Right, and we have ureters that go to the bladder, and then we have a urethra that then gets rid of the urine. So you can have an obstruction here at the ureter, uh, but in order to have post renal failure, it needs to be on both sides because one of the kidneys can compensate for the other. Uh, however, you would get a hydronephrosis on the affected side, or by having an obstruction at the urethra. You won't be able to urinate and urine will build up in the bladder and ultimately that pressure will uh, go back to the nephron. So obstruction increases back pressure on Bowman space. Remember our GFR equation. Um, this is kind of a complex equation, but notice here, here's the pressure, the uh, hydrostatic pressure in Bowman space. Ordinarily, it should be approximately zero. Um, but if you start to build up that pressure, this number is going to go up and therefore this uh, value is going to go down and our GFR is going to go down as well. Similar to in pre-renal failure, kidneys are going to increase reabsorption, but rather um, than with pre-renal failure where we're trying to reabsorb fluid to uh, maintain our intravascular volume, here we're reabsorbing fluid to kind of re uh, reduce the pressure in the urinary tract. Um, so we're going to get similar findings. You'll have a, a decreased urine sodium because of reabsorption and an increased urine osmolality because we are reabsorbing water and concentrating the urine. If the obstruction is proximal to the bladder, um, so in the ureter, you will see a, uh, a, a, um, an anuria because you're not getting urine into the bladder. Uh, and a hydronephrosis. Now, again, remember, um, you will only see an anuria if it's bilateral, in which uh, if it's unilateral, you will not have post-renal failure. So only if it's bilateral. However, if you have a unilateral ureteral obstruction, you will have hydronephrosis on the affected side, but it's got to be bilateral to cause a post-renal failure. If the obstruction is distal to the bladder, i.e. the urethra, uh, then you will have not only a bilateral hydronephrosis, but you will also have a suprapubic mass from your enlarged bladder. Um, so the problem here is not making urine. It's not, rather, it's not getting urine to the bladder. It's getting urine out of the bladder. So you'll also see an elevated post void residual and difficulty urinating despite an urge. The bladder is full, but you cannot get the urine out. Again, this is our basic workup for renal failure. You'll want to get all these things. And then these are um, the uh, different disorders we're going to talk about. This one, BPH, is probably the most high yield. Okay, so with BPH, what we have here is a benign and confluent enlargement of the prostate. This is painless. If you have a painful enlargement of the prostate, especially if it comes on suddenly, what you're dealing with there is prostatitis. Uh, a, benign, or a, a painless confluent enlargement is BPH, and this is something that just happens to older men. Uh, it's very, very common. Um, as a matter of fact, I would almost say it's normal, uh, but it causes 
issues for them. And uh, so we, we do treat this. Uh, what this ultimately boils down to is stimulation by dihydrotestosterone, DHT. And that is a byproduct of testosterone. So we have testosterone, an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase, and then we have DHT. And DHT is very potent. Not only does it cause prostatite or BPH rather, uh, but it also causes male pattern baldness. So if you have a patient who is bald, male pattern baldness, um, they are actually at higher risk to develop BPH later in life. Um, so this comes with a couple different symptoms. Storage symptoms include the frequency, urgency, and nocturia because their bladder is full. Voiding symptoms, when they try to urinate, it's a very weak stream. That's a dead giveaway. Hesitancy, straining, to try to increase the pressure in the bladder and proximal urethra to overcome that clamping of the prostate um, to try to get the urine out. They will generally not be able to completely empty because as the urine comes out, the pressure goes down and it's harder to get the urine out. And post-void dribbling is also common. Again, look for a confluently enlarged non-tender prostate on physical exam, as opposed to prostate cancer, where you tend to feel nodules. Ensure that there's no concomitant UTI or bladder calculus with a urinalysis. That should be pretty straightforward. Um, with a UTI, you'll see white blood cells, uh, nitrites, esterase, um, and uh, that's obviously going to need to be treated with antibiotics. With bladder calculi, you're going to see red blood cells. And that is uh, something that you would never see in BPH. Get a total and free PSA. If both are elevated, that points to BPH. However, if only the total PSA is elevated or it's elevated out of proportion to the free PSA, that likely points to cancer. So initially, we treat these patients with alpha-1 antagonists, so tamsulosin, doxazosin, and this is really useful for getting that, uh, it's not inflammation, um, so getting that enlargement uh, down a little bit to relieve their symptoms. And then in the long term, because this takes a while to work, we don't use it right away, but in the long term, um, we use those 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. By inhibiting uh, this enzyme here, we reduce the amount of DHT, and that will uh, help shrink the prostate a little bit. Uh, but it does take time for it to work, so it is not our initial therapy. Surgery will be considered for patients who have persistent symptoms despite maximal medical therapy. Neurogenic bladder is an umbrella term encompassing any kind of neurologic problem that interferes with the ability of the bladder to work properly. Now, you can have a spasmodic bladder, which would cause urinary urgency, or you can have a, a kind of a flaccid bladder, which would cause urinary retention, and that's what would cause post-renal failure. Look for neurologic etiologies here. So MS, a stroke, a spinal cord lesion, particularly cauda equina syndrome, and peripheral neuropathy, that's typically related to uncontrolled diabetes. Symptoms will vary by cause. Of course, if you have multiple sclerosis, you're going to have different symptoms than if you had cauda equina versus if you had peripheral neuropathy. Diagnosis is based on clinical suspicion of the cause. Obviously, these are all going to present very differently, um, but they do all have that post-renal failure in common if you have significant enough urinary retention. The treatment here is the underlying cause. However, you can decompress the bladder. You should decompress the bladder with intermittent catheterization, and often these patients will need to do this long term. And so remember that these patients are going to be at increased risk for a UTI because you are instrumenting the bladder. Urethral valves you should think of in children. This is the number one cause of bladder obstruction in boys and perhaps the most common cause of bladder obstruction in children overall. It is also a common cause of UTI, which is very uncommon in children and even more uncommon in boys. Uh, the symptoms here look for basically BPH symptoms, okay, because it's the same idea. You have a urethral blockage. Um, so look for a walnut-shaped mass above the pubic symphysis that indicates a full bladder. Diagnosis here, renal ultrasound um, is going to help. Uh, you may have a hydronephrosis. However, the best initial diagnostic test is a voiding cyst urethrogram, VCUG. This will show you the urethral valve. Um, so 
To diagnose this, uh, or sorry, to treat this, we want to decompress the bladder with a catheter and then send these patients off to pediatric urology for ablation of the urethral valve and they will be cured. Uh, note that a UTI in a child should always be considered some sort of congenital anomaly until proven otherwise, and you should get avoiding cyst urethrogram. Bladder cancer is the second most common urologic cancer and has a male predominance. These, this tends to happen in older men. It is usually a transitional cell uh, cancer. Um, there are risk factors. The most important is cigarette smoking. However, exposure to dyes is fairly common as well. Hairdressers. My grandma's hairdresser developed bladder cancer. And uh, immediately I knew when my grandma said, Mary has cancer. I'm like, mm, is it bladder cancer? How did you know? Well, she's a hairdresser. The most common presenting complaint is a painless gross hematuria. Almost 90% of patients will present that way. So this is important that you associate a painless gross hematuria uh, with bladder cancer. So these patients are going to pee orange or red um, and they're gonna know it. You, when you pee red, you're going to the doctor right away. Um, so you will have a good idea of what you're dealing with based on the patient's history. The best initial diagnostic test is a CT urogram. You should be able to visualize the tumor. However, the most accurate test and a necessary test is a cystoscopy because you need to biopsy it, which is necessary uh, for staging the cancer. And stage is going to uh, dictate our treatment. Often we'll give these patients chemotherapy, but not always. Bilateral ureteral stones is fairly uncommon. Usually you have to have something really significant that precipitates renal stones, so it happens on both sides. Usually when you get nephrolithiasis, it's only on one side. Um, so look for risk factors. People who have had kidney stones in the past are more likely to develop it again. Dehydration because of saturation of the urine, a high protein diet because of oxalate, inflammatory bowel disease uh, because of increased oxalate reabsorption. The calcium does not hold on to it. It gets, it saponifies with the fat, so you get increased oxalate reabsorption and then hypercalcemia. Symptoms here, nephrolithiasis, colicky flank pain that radiates to the groin or the testicles, nausea, vomiting. Diagnosis here, non-contrast CT of the pelvis, try to visualize the stone. Strain the urine for stone analysis to figure out what kind of stone you're dealing with. If this is a woman coming in with flank pain, make sure you get a pregnancy test because otherwise we're going to probably avoid a CT. Intravenous pilogram is always going to be the wrong answer. We use a non-contrast CT. Uh, the way we treat any kind of nephrolithiasis is with analgesics. You can go to indomethacin first, although many of these patients are going to need morphine. Uh, use an antiemetic, especially if they're already vomiting. We want to keep their hydration up and then give them fluids, again, to help flush out those kidneys. Uh, if the stone is really small, under five millimeters, we can wait for this to pass spontaneously. If it's five to 10 millimeters, use tamsulosin. It's called medical expulsive therapy. It's very effective. If it's more than 10 millimeters or they fail medical management, um, then you'll go with ureteroscopy or extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. So we go with more surgical management. And again, here's the characteristics of post renal failure. And here is a table of everything we talked about.